trauma. Everyone has it. No one talks about it. It seems easier to stay silent, ignore it, or stuff it than it does to honor it, learn from it, and finally heal. Trauma is debilitating, yet so often we suffer in silence. Trauma is not meant to be battled alone. And we are no longer going to suffer in silence. Together, we are creating a safe place to speak, to share our stories and grow our strength as we heal. Together, we are giving a voice to those who have been silenced, bringing darkness into light and letting God use our stories. Today, we find ourselves again. We relight our spark and let it light up the world. Stop SIS is a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating on issues of trauma and trafficking, as well as the amazing power of the healing journey. Welcome to Stop SIS. Hey, 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 you guys, big welcome back to Stop SIS, Stop Suffering in Silence. We have a very cool episode for you today. Uh, my name is Denise Walsh and I'm here with co-host Rachel Timothy. And today we are going to be talking about really, I, I mean, fascinating things about what the brain, how the brain handles trauma, that trauma survivors, it would be helpful for trauma survivors to know, but but really also supporters of trauma survivors to know as well. And I am going to be referencing a book that's down here called The Body Keeps the Score. And it's by Bessel van der Klock. And it's kind of an old book. It's been around quite a while. But what I have loved in reading this is that he doesn't just talk about the behavior. He talks about the brain and the, and the body chemistry and the things that shift within us within all humans when we experience trauma, which will then connect or just make understanding of why trauma survivors behave in certain ways. So Rachel, I know you read this book years ago, and I'd love to hear a bit about why it was helpful to you then. Well, it validated things. Like I remember reading it and being like, oh my goodness, I'm not the only one. Like there's a reason for this. Um, and it really helped with my shame because I shamed myself for a lot of behaviors, a lot of feelings, um, a lot of reactions, a lot of struggles with relationships. I shamed myself daily, but to be able to know there's a biological or a physical reason behind it helped me put the shame aside and start working on it instead of just beating myself up. Right. Well, and that's why this podcast is called Stop Suffering in Silence, because trauma can put us in little silos where we feel like we are the only ones experiencing mm-hmm. something. And so books like this help to bridge that gap to say, no, this is how people, all humans respond to trauma. And mm-hmm. so what you're experiencing is not abnormal. Right. Uh, Carson Daly recently talked about his panic attacks on the Today Show, and he actually used the word stop suffering in silence because he suffered in silence because he didn't feel like anybody would understand the panic attacks that he was having. But knowledge is power. If people have knowledge, then that's where the community is really beneficial. Yeah. A confused mind shuts down. And so if you're living in cloudiness or confusion, then, you know, you're more prone to isolate. You can't create a plan. You can't, you can't effectively communicate because you're, you know, closed off and in your own. You're in defensive mode. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the, one thing I wanted to share that I found interesting in this book is called this region of the frontal lobe. I feel very smart. Is called the Bracus area. And without a functioning Braca's area, you cannot put your thoughts and feelings into words. The scans showed that the Braca's area went offline when a flashback was triggered. Hmm. And so you think of the trauma event itself, and then you think of the reliving of the trauma event that happens, and it stays in your frontal lobe. It keeps you know, you're reliving it over and over again. You're rethinking about it. You, you are in your Braca's area 
is shut off, which means it's really hard to take what you're imagining or what you're seeing or what you experienced and put it into words. Yeah, I have, I have a great example. I have, well, I could probably talk for hours about examples where my Baracus shut off (laughs) or lives shut off in, in a way, but there was one particular time, um, one of the first times I was taken to the FBI to discuss my childhood case. And um, I was in a room, I had an advocate with me. It was not granny yet, but I had an advocate with me and I had um, an FBI officer sitting across from me, this big table, really intimidating. Um, And he kept asking me these questions that took my mind back to the trauma and the abuse and I was seeing it and I was feeling it and everything, but I couldn't get the words out and I could visibly see the frustration on his face. Like, why are you even here? Why are you here to tell me what's going on? If you're not going to talk, he was frustrated. And at one point, all I could get out was, can I have a drink of water? And so he left and walked out of the room to go get me a drink of water. Like, you could tell upset was like slamming the door, like just felt like I was wasting his time and I get it, but he didn't understand either. The advocate next to me leaned over and is like, what's going on? Like, why aren't you telling him? And I said, I can't, I cannot get the words out of my throat. I can see it. I can't get the words out of my throat. And, you know, there was really nothing he could say in support. The FBI officer walked in, totally different demeanor. Apparently I had cameras on me and I didn't know it. And when he walked out, he watched and listened to what I had to say to my advocate and completely different atmosphere when he walked back in, because then he was somewhat more understanding that this is not me trying to play games. It's not me wasting his time. I physically cannot do this right now. I want to, but I can't. So what does one do in that situation? Because I I mean, I'm thinking of parents we've talked to who are talking to their kids saying, what is wrong? Like, what is wrong? Why, what is happening? Why are you in tears? What is going on? And just no words come out. Is it best to give people a, a pen and a paper when they're in the midst of that and have them write? Yes, absolutely. And even my oldest, we do that. If he's struggling, I'll say, write it down and he'll hand me a note. And now he does it without me even saying it. And he's able to say things he otherwise wouldn't have been able to. And we can process it and and get through it. Yes, write it down. Okay. Okay. Had the FBI officer handed me a notebook and a pen and said, write down or draw what you see. Could have done that. I really think I could have done at least a part of it at that point. Right. So in the midst of the flashback, even, so it could be years later, but you're experiencing a flashback. Do you feel that same clenching of the throat and unableness to share? Yes, I do. And there's still to this day flashbacks I've never said verbally. Um, And there's, you know, there's almost all of them I've written down, but there's many that I've yet to say verbally. And it probably would be helpful to write it down and then say it afterwards, read it. Mm -hmm. Um, But even that, like, there's just something in me that's like, I can't, which is probably means I should. (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) (laughs) but you're right. And, and so it's, again, it's interesting for the survivor standpoint, or I'm sorry, for the supporter standpoint, to be like, I want to help you, but mm-hmm. I don't know how, and I don't know what to do. And I don't know what to say, because I don't even really know what happened. Right. Asking to write it down is, is a huge step in that direction. Do you feel like the survivor needs to relax a bit or be taken into, you know, like when is a good time to, to do that? Is the, do they need to relax or decompress or is even in the midst of the flashback, writing it down is helpful. Hmm. That's a good question. I guess it depends on your functionality with the flashback. If it's completely taking over your day, your life, um, like you cannot function, you need to get it out as quickly as possible. There are times when I have, I'm able to function and I have things I need to do. And I will tell myself, okay, I'm going to come back and we're going to process this. But right now 
I need to do X, Y, and Z. And for the most part, I'm able to do that. Sometimes I push it longer than I should. And then the flashback's like, eh, 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 hey, you forgot about me. I'm still here. <laughs> and so then, you know, it becomes more red flagish talk to me and I'm able to write it down at that point. Okay. Another thing it says in the book, it says all trauma is pre-verbal. It says victims of assaults and accidents sit mute and frozen in emergency rooms. Traumatized children lose their tongues and refuse to speak. Photographs of combat shoulders show, show hollow eyed men staring mutely into a void. Even years later, traumatized people can have enormous difficulty telling other people what has happened to them. Their bodies re-experience terror, rage, helplessness, as well as the impulse to fight or flee. But these feelings are almost always impossible to articulate. Yeah. Oh, that's powerful because it's true. It's like your body gets hijacked for a time, like it gets stolen. Yeah. The bracus area is turned off. Mm -hmm. Like there's a physical reason why this happens. It's yes. not just somebody being difficult or, you know, choosing even to not share or to live in this state of fight or flight. But right. we know that when you're in, when the, um, when you're in fight or flight mode, your brain, blood goes from your brain to your limbs. And so you're not able to think as clearly. Apparently your Braca's area turns off and like physical and, and then hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, all that stuff are like coursing through your veins, whether it's in the midst of the trauma or in the midst of the flashback, all of those mm -hmm. same physical symptoms happen either way. Yeah. And so what you desperately need is connection but yet you can't verbalize it. You are not even making sense. You're saying things that make people want to run the other direction. You're acting like you're nine years old. And so the people that you're desperately needing is like, what is going on? And they want to, they want to leave. And then you end up in isolation and you're afraid to even open your mouth. Well, and I don't even know if it's, they want to leave or like, they just don't have hours to sit with you <laughs> or right. it's like, you yeah. know, like they, you know, we've got an hour here. If we don't get it out. I have another appointment or whatever it is because they've oh, got goodness. their other <laughs> activities in their day. Yes. That is why granny would go with me sometimes to counseling because here we would be sitting there and it'd be like 55 minutes into the conversation and I wouldn't have hardly said anything. And then I finally get a few things out and our time is up. And she's like, you just wasted a whole, like, this is your hour for the week. And you sat there and said nothing. So she would come and be like, okay, here we go. This is what we need to work on. This is what happened this week and go. <laughs> and was it helpful for her to start the conversation? Did you? Yes, it, end up it was. Okay. And not only was it helpful because like there would be times the counselor would ask something and granny would try to answer it because I was sitting mute, but granny, I mean, she's not me. So she doesn't say it exactly right. And so then I would be like, whoa, 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 no, this is how I feel. And then before I knew it, it was almost like I was just having a conversation with granny and the counselor just happened to be there. And I got a lot more out, but in the same sense, she was able to learn a lot from the counselor as I was sitting there and they were able to explain things to her that she, that helped her deal with me basically. Well, I think that's interesting to number one, have more, um, a third party. So going to a counselor or having that third party there, because even if you and granny were talking about it amongst yourselves, the counselor was able to see it objectively and give you steps forward. Um, and then, but also to have granny start the verbiage, you know, <laughs> So, um, it is kind of an, I'm just thinking of like my own children. I'm like, what if I totally went off the wall and said something like, well, is it the Easter bunny that blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no, it's this. Is that a way, <laughs> could that be a way to get them into talking? Yes. <laughs> the frustration makes the bronchial work. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know. But what I have learned in, um, in, uh, over these years is I think the one main thing that a survivor, or I'm sorry, a supporter, a supporter can do while creating the opportunity for listening, creating the opportunity to write, um, 
being a support, even if they can't spend six hours asking questions, how are you feeling today? What's going on? Knowing that you can go talk to them, like you didn't scare them off. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's important too. Like this can, we can totally talk about this if you want to, I'm open to it. Just know that I'm not going to, if you don't want to answer a question, that's totally fine. But just know that I'm available if this is something you want to talk about. But at the end of the day, the most important thing that I've seen, and you can let me know what you think is congruency, meaning saying and doing line up. So for example, oh, yes. that's important. If somebody were to say, I support you, but then you find out they're gossiping. Yeah. That's not, I mean, that's a blow. If somebody is, you know, there's just that incongruency of saying, I support you, but not reaching out for three months or, you know, I don't know. What do you think? No. Yes. Because if you don't do what you're, what you say, if your actions don't match your words, yeah. you become unsafe Okay. because that was how it was with our predators. Their actions didn't match their words. And even though you are not going to do to me what my predator did, it still feels unsafe to me. I, I can't trust what you're saying because your actions don't follow it. And yeah, that so congruent is a great word. And then the other thing is, it seems like learn being open to learning about it has that been helpful when your friends have been open to learning or open to asking questions what else has been helpful for a supporter to do yeah so like I've had some people who are just like x y and z this is what you need to do when this week this is what you need to do this is what will make you feel better telling me um about me when they don't, you know, like they don't necessarily know everything about my story. They don't know everything about me. There's no way they can know my fix all, but they talk to me as if they do in an authoritative way. And that doesn't get near as far as saying, Hey, let's learn this together. Let's figure this out. Like, why are you struggling with this? Let's learn together. Um, why do you feel this way? And listen to me and then come to a conclusion together, almost prompting me in the right direction, pushing me in the right direction until I come to the conclusion myself. You're laughing because you've done this with me. <laughs> I know you have. Yeah, It's mind games, <laughs> but it's in a positive way. <laughs> Well, you're right, because there's a difference in, and and we were chatting about this a bit earlier, when I'm in leadership, I'm providing a path to follow. This is what you do. This is what you say. Here you go. You're going to love it. You know, and I'm, I'm like cast in vision. I'm three steps ahead of you, that kind of thing. That's a different role than a coach or even a counselor whose role is to say, what do you think? And what do you want to do when this starts to pop up for you? And I remember even when we started working together and I was going to help create a healthy plan for you and, you know, give you good nutrition ideas and that kind of thing. And instead of creating it and sending it to you and saying, here's your plan, which is what my coach does for me. I have a healthy eating coach, like for my bodybuilding stuff. She just sends me the plan. But what I realized in, in, in talking with our first few times was that there's been so many times when you were told what to do and I wanted to give you an opportunity to discover. So instead we said, this is your life. What do you want for breakfast? <laughs> and yeah. I remember your energy through the Zoom go, wow. And it felt like a big sigh of relief. Yeah. Because up until that point, I had failed over and over in doing the things that people told me to do. So did it feel different if you chose it? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, because the control is back in my hands. And that that control was stolen from me years and years ago. Um, now, there are times when I try to give the control back to my supporter or to other people because I get scared. I become that nine-year-old little girl again, and I want you to take care of it because I don't think I'm capable. And sometimes my support system has to say, no, even if you fail, even if you fall on your face, you need to do this for yourself. Not not necessarily even if you like end up getting hurt or anything like that. Like, But still... There were things like even making phone calls. I hated making phone calls and I would, you know, I, I'd get anybody to do that for me. Um, but big girl stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and in reality, it's stuff that you hadn't had practice with. Yeah, it's true. It, it felt so outside your comfort zone. You're like, all right, we're going to call for pizza. You're going to call. Let's practice. <laughs> that really, that was hard for me. Yeah. How crazy is that? But no, seriously, like, so not only was it doing the action, but then I had to figure out who I was going to be when I did that action. Am I going to be super chipper and act like everything is good? Am I going to be real and act and show that I'm depressed? Am I going to be somewhere in the middle? Am I going to cry? Am I, oh, girl, pizza, ordering pizza. That is a lot of energy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay. So for the survivor to know, no, gosh, I'm sorry. I keep messing it up. For a supporter to know that all of that is happening in a survivor's mind and in their body, even if the idea is right, just to call for pizza or just to take this one action step. Uh, it, I think it gives compassion for the things you're asking a survivor to do. Yes. And then another thought is the shame that a survivor is already feeling and experiencing, not even just about the abuse, but about the coping skills that they've been using for the, through the years or the shame of, you know, the stuff, 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 blow, you know, like passive, passive, and then aggressive outbursts or, Maybe it's just the second guessing that happens anytime you're in a social situation because am I good enough? I don't know. Just the insecurity that Mm -hmm. happens. We've talked to several survivors who have really great support systems and they've said, I know you are already giving yourself a hard time. (laughs) So I don't need to add to that. I'm going to validate you and how the best you handled the situation or this family function or this, whatever the situation is, I'm going to be your biggest cheerleader because I know you don't need more shoulds in your life. Mm, Yeah, exactly. Now, I'm sure there are times when it's helpful to say, how about you try it this way next time? Um, But you got to be careful not to be an enabler. Right. And also to like, you want to push them for better but yet you also want to have compassion with why they are the way they are. So I think that's why the conversation, having a conversation around it, but not in a judgmental way. Um, I think the more that the supporter learns about trauma, but yet doesn't act like they know it all, it just helps them have a better conversation with a survivor. I know uh, there was one particular time I had been hurt as an adult. I say hurt. I had been brutally raped as an adult. And um, it was really, really hard for my husband to, to understand why I didn't fight. Like, why not scream? Why not yell? Why not get somebody's, why not run? Why didn't you fight? And he didn't want to verbalize that to me, but yet I could tell that's how he felt. And so knowing that, seeing that in his body language made me feel terrible, but he just didn't know. Finally, he got into a counselor and the counselor was able to explain to him, this is why she didn't fight. This is what she was feeling, what it was like for her. You know, everybody in their brother can say, oh, this is what I will do when somebody attacks me, but you really don't know what your body will do. If you'll fight, fight, flight, freeze, or fold, like you don't know until you're in it. And it could be different every time. And so giving him that understanding and that knowledge and seeing him look at me different, even not even words, but just look at me different, helped our relationship a whole, whole lot. What else do you think it would be helpful for supporters to know? I think there's, um, there's times when I have to process and I have to be still and it will appear lazy. And I remember, I remember being in a flashback and sitting there and just needing to let my mind do its thing, but not knowing how to say that to my husband. I mean, he doesn't, didn't really understand what a flashback was at that time. He was busy with the kids or cleaning the house. And here I was sitting in my bed understanding that those moments they come and they're not me tapping out or quitting. Cause I remember there'd be times he'd say, don't quit. Don't just lay down. Like 
I'm actually doing some really, really hard work right now. And when I'm in a flashback, I can't verbalize that to you. So having that conversation prior to, or having the support person know ahead of time, like what to do in a flashback situation is important too. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I think a lot of, a lot of what a support person can do is help prepare or practice for when I remember another survivor we were working with said, what do I do if I see this person around town? And she was afraid to leave her house because she did not want to see this person around town. And then they created a plan. And they said, if we see this person, we will get in the car and leave. And I mean, it sounds so silly, but if you don't have a plan, again, it's that confusion or that cloudiness, that uncertainty that can keep us stuck. So creating a plan with a survivor, what do I do if a flashback happens? How do we handle the holidays together? Do we have like a wink where we're like, a time to get out of here? You know, what is it that we can do so that we're on the same page and, is, and able to communicate as best as possible? Yeah. And our coping skill might not make sense to you either. You know, the way you would cope would be different than the way I would cope. Um, but, and... I think always understanding also that you might not be the person that I tell all to and being okay with that. It doesn't mean you're any less loved. I don't tell my husband a lot of what I went through. He doesn't know, but for some people, their husband does know everything. It just depends. And for me, that's granny. And that's, that makes it to where I feel more comfortable around my husband I don't know. It just works for us. But he had to get to a point where he was accepting of that. Like, you know, that that's okay. That doesn't mean I don't love him any less. Right. Right. So there's times to, to create space to process a situation, whether it be a flashback or an event or, you know, even just I mean, you think of introverts, like they need a minute after a big event to relax or to process and to recharge, but then also perhaps the space to talk about it if necessary. Yeah. And making it as normal as possible. Okay. You know, trying to not be like, okay, let's talk about your mental illness today. Or, you know, like, don't, don't make you feel any more like an oddball than you already feel Um, as much make it normal as possible. Um, because it is a normal reaction. Everything that the survivor is feeling, reacting to, it is normal. It may not be your normal, but it's normal for what they went through. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, this, you guys, this is PTSD. This is even, um, what is, is it called chronic PTSD? That's like the stream. Is that what I'm, and this, this is what happens when, when, your body has gone through a traumatic experience and it does store those memories and keeps it locked up until your body starts to relax and the flashbacks start to happen. And so I think reading this book for me is just giving words to the things that I've seen over the years with trauma survivors. People can't express. Yes. Yes. They can't express their bodies tightened up and it, it floods their body with cortisol and adrenaline, and then your body can stay in that fight or flight mode, even if the trauma is supposedly over. And so part of the healing journey is relearn. I mean, we retrain our brain, right? We retrain our neural pathways and have new thought patterns, but we also want to retrain our body chemistry. We're getting Mm. out of fight or flight mode and into the world of dreams. As I call it, we're in rest and relaxation. That's part of the healing process is to say, this is over now. Yeah. I am safe and I am now intentionally creating a safe spot for me to live and new friends or new community or new family or whatever. And And that's what you want to do as a support system is create that safe place for your survivor where they don't have shame, judgment, ridicule. They can just be themselves. Yeah. Amen. I think, um, another thing is, uh, There's so many divorces that come because one or the other or both have had trauma, undealt with trauma in the past, whether they knew about it or didn't know about it. And it popped up all of a sudden and it changes the dynamic of the marriage, the relationship. Um, Sometimes you have to grieve the marriage that you thought you were going to have. And me and my spouse have been there. Like we've had to grieve the fact that we don't have a normal marriage. And my heart breaks for my husband for that. Like, I wish that I could 
not have flashbacks and PTSD. And, and I wish that he didn't have secondary PTSD because I had PTSD, you know, like there's so many things that both of us wish were different, but living in denial, which is where we lived for a while, room 101, um, was not helpful either. And it just prolonged our healing journey. And it made it to where we never really did connect because we were both living in dream worlds of what we wish our marriage was like. Um, but you need to grieve it. Yeah. And so if your spouse is stuck somewhere and maybe they're not getting the help that you wish that they needed as quickly as you don't shame them, but also allow yourself a grief period because it, that hurts. It's hard to see someone you love hurt. Yeah. Yeah. We call it like, what are you pretending not to know? What are you sticking your head in the sand about? What are you la 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 la? Everything's fine. When like the fight house is on fire. Right. So being radically honest about where things are again, creates that clarity. And even if that clarity sucks for a minute, at least we know where we are. So then we can move forward. Yeah, exactly. I think another thing would be, um, when you end up in a relationship and the survivor's coping skill is severe, it, like what if they're highly medicating themselves and in a completely numb state or alcohol or drugs or go, like in those situations, what would you recommend for a supporter? Or workaholic or avoid, you know, I think for somebody who's consistently living in the negative coping skill, going la la la, everything's fine when it's clearly not fine. I guess I would say, what do you recommend? Do you recommend a supporter to say, hey, <laughs> this is not working. Something is not working. We've got to figure this out. But like what we're doing now is not working. You drinking is not working or this you know, you are working 24 seven, um, or, you know, all of this, how could a supporter who sees the house burning, but the survivor is like, I'm fine. Everything's fine. What maybe they say? need a wake up call because maybe the survivor has gotten so comfortable in their dreamland that they don't realize how much destruction they're causing around them. You know, maybe they're comfortable in their little cozy safe place in a house that's on fire, but everybody around them is blazing and maybe they need a wake up call. Maybe it's a, you know, I mean, every situation is different, so I don't know, but even saying a stay for a while at a alcohol place, uh, eating disorder, uh, mental health, because this isn't working right. and a wake up call. And I think that's the a, a question you can ask that hopefully wouldn't put up as many boundaries or um, defenses as some other questions might. Um, again, we want to avoid you should, uh, right. the shoulds, but right. how is this working for you? Are you enjoying life right now the way that it is? Because again, the goal is to get people to say it for themselves. And right. even if they say, yeah, everything's fine. You can ask again, really? Do you really like the way things are right now? Right. And, and be honest about how you feel too. Like, not that it's their fault, but that we're not just in this world to survive. Like that's not our only purpose is to keep living. Like we need, we need to move forward. We need growth. And if your survivor is okay with not growing, then there needs to be something, something done. For their own sake too. I mean, is that really loving them when you're allowing them to continue to, to hurt themselves? Right. Right. And that hopefully could be a conversation you have, and then you include a counselor or an inpatient stay or something to really get them the help they need. Because what, what people do, right, is they think, I know that happened, but I'm fine now. And they've never really dealt with it or experienced, allowed themselves to grieve or expressed any of that stuff. So it's under the rug and it's, and it's bubbling and it's impacting every single day, even if we don't quite realize it because 97% of our behavior is run by our subconscious brain. And so it's this, and they say, clear the cobwebs. Like we've got to do some of that hard work. So we have a clean slate to work with. Yeah, definitely. And I think you can't leave God out of the equation. 
And so many times when a survivor is using negative coping skills, whether it is highly medicating drugs, alcohol, whatever it is, they're leaving God out of the equation. They're saying, he can't do this for me. And if you allow them to stay in, in that spot, you're green. Like God can't do this for you. you know, but that's not reality. That's not the truth. And so opening their eyes and maybe saying, I am going to put this boundary up because I think if I, if, if I put this boundary up and I give it to God, then that will hopefully make it to where they will say, okay, enough's enough. I need to get help. Um, but just accepting everything as it is, is not giving God the glory for what he really could be doing in their life. And what's so cool about that is when a survivor lays down the negative coping skills, freaking the heck out, usually you're not like, oh, here you go, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you're, you've held on to this negative coping skill for years because it's the only yes. thing that helped you feel better. Right. But when you lay it down and you make that shift, you can see miracles start to happen in your life that couldn't happen because you were holding on to that, that coping skill. Oh, so true. Preach it. Seriously. That is, <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, we both have to pick up our children from school soon, so we're going to have to end, but this is just like one itty bitty couple pages from this book. So if you are a survivor or a supporter, this book is really a great resource to learning about how the body responds to trauma. And then I think you can spot it. So you'll be able to tell when, you know, okay, I know what a flashback looks like now and I can see you shutting down. I'm gonna give you some space to process this. Let me know when you're ready. Or do you wanna write it down? Or you know what, you are in fight or flight a little bit, like you're in a bit of chaos right now. You need to go hang out with some friends. Like let's get you some alone time. Let's rejuvenate. And I think just being in that supportive environment will give the survivor a chance to, to really begin the healing journey because trust has been built. Yes, absolutely. All right, you guys. Well, we want to hear what books have been helpful for you on your healing journey. Um, post them in the comments below or in our Instagram, you can message us there or post on some of Rachel's posts, some of your favorite books. There will be two, we have two reels, is that it? Two stories, two reels, two something on Instagram that you can comment on about each episode. So find this specific episode and um, post under that. And we'd love to hear from you. What books helped you on your healing journey? Or do you think it would be helpful for supporters to read as well? And then we are almost to our 25th episode. So on our 25th episode, we want to do two things. Number one, we want to give back to you. And number two, we want to connect to you. So with you. So we are going to do a bit of a giveaway. And then we're also going to invite you guys into a Zoom um, and with us. And this will be great for supporters and or survivors. So keep that on your radar. That will be opened up or offered in the 25th episode. Anything else you want to add? I think that's it. All right, you guys. Thanks for being here. Have an amazing day and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this powerful episode of Stop Suffering in Silence. If you are interested in booking Rachel to speak at your school, your church, or on your podcast, then please email openblindeyes at protonmail.com. If you are interested in sponsoring a survivor on their healing journey and would like to donate to Stop Sis, then please check out the link in the description box or show notes below, or you can email stopsis at protonmail.com. And finally, if you are currently suffering in silence or you know somebody who is, whether they're dealing with a current trauma or one from the past, then we will always recommend that you reach out to your local resources and find a counselor that you can trust because nobody is meant to suffer alone. Have an amazing week and thank you for being here.